Right, good afternoon, ladies and gents. Welcome to this month's uh, monthly update between myself and Colin Szynski in our Toronto office. And this week, or this month, I should say, we'll be previewing this evening's FOMC meeting, trying to dissect um, the likely course of action with respect to either the tone of the statement or whether or not, and what, and what sort of tone, essentially, I think that Janet Yellen will adopt in the wake of the, I think, um, ambivalent, I think, or ambi ambi amb ambiguous, ambiguous, see, I said it, ambiguous data that we've been getting out of the U.S. economy. But before we get started, let's put up the obligatory compulsory risk warning, um, which I'm obviously com you know, compelled to do by my compliance department. So let's, um, let's get that out of the way. And then we can pretty much crack on and get started. So, as I say, we've got quite a bit to get through, but I think the two primary drivers of market sentiment at the moment are obviously concerns about Greece, and I'm not really going to talk about that at the beginning because I think that pretty, that's pretty, pretty much done to death. Um, let's start, Colin, with yeah, let's the Fed. F FOMC, the Fed, Federal Reserve. Um, we, I think we can both agree that they're not going to raise rates this month. No, that was pretty much ruled out in March when they uh, when they cut their forecast. Yeah, um, and for me, you know, there's, there's there's a whole school of debate as to the timing or otherwise of a Fed rate rise. I think it's unlikely that they're going to do it. Um, they're going to do it this month, and it's unlikely they're going to do it in July, um, given obviously what's going on in Europe and all the uncertainty surrounding a Greek default. So really, it's a question of. First and foremost, the tone of the statement, and also, I think, what the dot charts look like. Now, you've done a nice little diagram for us, Colin, so why don't you describe what we're seeing right here? These are the dot charts. Sure. These are the dot charts, and what these are is literally they take all of the the, the FOMC members' forecasts for the in, uh, Fed funds rate at the end of the year and, and plot them on this chart. And how these charts change uh, over time is quite significant. The, when I look at this, and this is what's published, they actually publish this, the, the Fed does, so this is their chart. Um, I don't even bother with the, the, with the out of years because that's nice, but, I mean, that doesn't concern us. It's really the left one here. And when we started the year, there was a huge cluster up and around one and a half two percent and at the last meeting in March where the last time so that was December they were up there and there was another cluster in and around one percent and in the March meeting all of this came down to this big cluster narrowed in between about 0.75 and and one percent half a percent and one percent we're at a quarter of a percent now so these two dots at the bottom are basically the the people that think there will be no increase this year and then if we go up we'll say that one dot uh, above it would be one increase. This big group here would be two increases, and this group of three would be three increases between now and the end of the year. So to, after today, there's four meetings left. So we can look at this a couple of ways. First off, you can say, okay, well, uh, one increase at the end of the year would mean they go in December meeting and they sneak it in two weeks before the end of the year. Two increases, there's two ways you can do that. Either you can go September, December, or you can go October, December. If you're going to go to three increases, then you've got to either go every meeting from September or you start in July and you can take a meeting off depending on how things go. So what we're looking at still is the majority at this point of Fed members are still calling for two to three array hikes by the end of this year. We'll see how this changes with, uh, with when this table is published this afternoon. If this big group starts to come push down again farther into the, into the, uh, the zero or one percent rate hike camp, then certainly that also not only does it say less rate hikes, but it also pushes out the, uh, the start date for timing. And uh, well, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, about what, uh, what the rest of the forecast means. So what I, I mentioned that, that back in March, the thing, most people at, in, at the beginning of the year figured June was it, today was going to be the day of rate, li rate, rate liftoff, and of course that didn't happen. And the signal from the Fed at the time that this wasn't going to happen, they were going to push it out, was that in March they cut their forecast, their Fed fund forecast I just talked about, but also GDP and inflation. It's pretty hard to start raising interest rates when you're cutting your forecasts. Uh, in the inter 
intervening time, we've had uh, forecast cuts from the, the IMF and others uh, to the U.S. economy. And the question is, are they catching up to the Fed, or does the Fed need to catch up to them? It, it, it's hard to say. But I think what we're looking at here in I terms would of the – I something uh, to that. Go ahead, Michael, and then I'll talk to the, the three uh, yeah. outcomes. Basically, the forecast cuts we've seen from the IMF and the OECD were this month. Yeah. So they're three months after the Fed. So I would argue that they're probably not catching up with the Fed. They could actually be front-running the Fed. Uh, definitely a possibility. In which, in which case, we could actually see growth and inflation forecast downgrades this meeting and not left the same. And if that happens, then that potentially could push out a rate hike back to the back end of this year. But go on. Uh, absolutely. So I think there's there's three scenarios that we could see with regards to the uh, with regards to the forecasts. Uh, as Michael said, if they cut their forecasts again, you can rule out September and, and likely that they wouldn't do anything until the very, very end of the year. Uh, I still think they may do something this year just to, to get it in, kind of like we saw a couple of years back with the uh, when they started tapering. They, they got one in right at the very end of the year at the December meeting. So it's possible that that's still a, a, a very open possibility uh, at this point. If they do nothing and change their forecasts, it still leaves the door open to September and I think in the statement they're going to kind of word it to give them maximum flexibility. In the past, they had uh, the Fed had been uh, very much on transparency, tell everybody we're not going to do anything for years. The Fed's kind of gone back the other way now, and they're trying to give themselves more flexibility through their speeches and statements of, of the last few months. The third scenario, which is the least likely one, which is that they actually raise their forecasts. If they did that, the street would likely see that as a signal that they'd be ready to go as soon as July. So if we uh, my feeling is a, a, an increase in, in forecasts unlikely, but would mean July. Steady as she goes on forecasts would mean September or October, and, and a cut to forecasts would mean probably possibly December for, for interest rate left off. Yeah, I mean, that, that pretty much, I think, sums it up quite nicely. And I certainly think in terms of what U.S. yields are doing, um, we did hit 2.5% earlier this month, which is obviously this down move here that we saw in the U.S. 10-year note um, when prices dropped to just above 125. Now, what we've seen here on the Japanese candlestick chart is what I call is almost a bullish engulfing day. Now, usually bullish engulfing days are harbingers um, of a significant upward move in prices. At the moment, we're running into a little bit of resistance at 126.65, which also happens to be the March lows and also um, the May lows that we saw um, last month. Now, that then presupposes what would cause prices, U.S. Treasury prices, to go up and yields to go down. And for me, that would be a dovish Fed. So if this is a bullish reversal on the U.S. 10-year note, then we could well get a dovish Fed. And we could then push through this resistance level on the price and go back up to the 200-day moving average. So for me, I'm still probably more dovish or, or bearish on the dollar than I am bullish. People, I think there's an awful lot of people out there who seem to think that because of all this Greece scenario, Euro-dollar has the potential to go lower. But we've had a very good payrolls number earlier this month at 280,000. And that did cause a significant dollar rally. But what it didn't do is it didn't push it below 110.5. And, and given we were only around about 112, you would have thought that if the market was positioned or looking to position itself for a rise in U.S. rates, they would have pushed it that much lower given concerns about a Greece exit, a default and what have you. And that's, that's not happening at the moment. And given what the pound is doing against the dollar, I actually think the pound can go probably to 158 and even 160 over the course of the next few weeks and months. Well, that suggests to me a weaker dollar. Well, a weaker dollar doesn't tie in with the narrative of a hawkish Fed. So at the moment, we're at a, I think we're at a very, very key, I think, tipping point in terms of where the dollar goes to next, which brings me into my dollar index chart, which I used in my weekly video um, on Tuesday. This, um, this chart here from the May highs suggests that we're in a very nice little downward, downward channel or downward trend. 
Um, it currently comes in around about 95, 60, 95, 70. That more or less coincides, I think, with euro dollar um, around about 110 and a half. You've got to bear in mind that the dollar index, 57% um, of the dollar index is the euro dollar, so there is quite a good correlation. It can get skewed a little bit by dollar yen when when you get significant moves in that. But by and large, generally the downward track in the dollar index usually does feed into a narrative of a slightly firmer euro. And until such times as we break this downtrend line and uh, and this um, this resistance level here, I think you have to be a little bit cautious about being overly longer dollars. The highs are getting lower, the lows are getting lower, and until such times as we take out this series of highs here, um, I think you need to be cautious about being overtly dollar bullish. There's also one other factor at play here, and that's spread differentials between U.S. 10-year treasuries and bunds. And the spread differentials have been coming down in favor of the bund and the euro since those euro-dollar lows of 104.50 that we saw in March. And the trend for this does appear to be suggesting that the spread differential between U.S. 10 years and German bunds is to come in in the bunds' favor. That, again, is likely to be euro-supportive. Now, you know, you, what happens in the event of a Greek exit, I hear you ask, or a Greek default? You certainly will probably get a little bit of a sell-off in euro-dollar, which would shake out an awful lot of long positions. But unless we break below 110.5, I still think that there's potential for more upside in euro-dollar than downside. It's a brave trade, but if you actually look at what euro-dollar has been doing over the course of the last few months, what we've actually been seeing here, let's just get that out of the way. It's not really been doing anything particularly um, noteworthy for the past two or three months. If we zoom this out, we can see that, again, that's almost like the dollar index chart, only it's upside down. We've got a nice uptrend coming in here. We are trading ever so slightly higher here. We've got higher low, higher low, higher low. Every single dip lower, the basically the buyers are waiting um, less and less to actually come in and rebuy it. So at the moment, the price is compressing. The key resistance level, I think, for euro dollar at the moment is obviously the highs that we've seen this month, but also the highs that we saw in May. So between 114 and 115, big, big level for euro dollar. If we break through there, then we're certainly looking at a significant move to 118. But I think what is actually fairly compelling with respect to euro dollar as opposed to cable is the way cable's taken off. And I think yeah. uh, can we go back to euro dollar for a sec, Michael? We can we absolutely, it? yeah, yep, yeah, sure. Sorry, I didn't mean to block your train of thought. I just wanted no, to no, add no, something that's here. Fine. If we go, uh, just taking a look at this in a little bit bigger perspective as well, you've got a pretty substantial double bottom back there in March and April. And uh, on top, I mean, look, yeah. so, yeah. you know, in terms of Brexit, right, when we see yeah. how far the euro dollar has come down uh, over, the, over the course of the winter and into the spring, then you had a double bottom back in March and April, and now you're sitting here and forming this really nice ascending triangle. I mean, this is a very, very nice base forming, and you could even almost make a, a – it's not a great case, but if you look at that January low, the double bottom, and then the low at the end of May, that's a, a, a weak head and shoulders on top of all of that. So you've got some mm. very, very powerful uh, technical bullish patterns forming, some of which are stronger than others. But, but when you put it all together, uh, it suggests that you've got a pretty solid base here forming, and, uh, and people have, been, you know, have had quite some time to consider the, uh, the potential for, uh, for Grexit and, and other fact, whether it's Greece coming down, the U.S. starting to raise interest rates and what have you. I mean, these, these things aren't surprises anymore. People have had a lot of time to uh, to dwell on them, and, and the euro is actually starting to come back the other way, which I find really, really intriguing. Especially this uh, pattern here, which I outlined, I think, in May, a bullish yes. engulfing month um, and a double bottom, a tweezer bottom. Now, in you know pure classic candlestick formation, if you get a strong pattern like that, then I think there's potential for a significant move higher. Everyone is still talking for euro dollar below parity. Um, get, when I see a pattern like that, I just don't buy it. I just cannot see how that can happen. That is a strong bullish reversal on the Japanese candlestick charts on a monthly chart. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to go racing to 120 or 130 over the next two to three weeks. It could well happen over the next six to nine months. What could cause that to happen? 
Lord only knows. I'm, I'm only going to go on the price action. There is a tendency, I think, to trade on headline risk, which is all negative news about Greece. Oh, we've got to sell the euro. We've got to sell the euro. It's all bad. The wheels are going to fall off. Trade the price action. Don't trade the headlines. Price action here tells me that the euro dollar, it could be on the cusp of build or carving out a significant base. And until such times as we break below 110.50, but also here we've got the 50 and 100 day moving averages forming a potential golden cross. We've also got the 200 day moving average coming in at 117. So all the long term indicators are starting to point to a form of basing pattern. And while the interim price action may be very, very messy and very, very choppy, the fact of the matter is, unless we break below 110.50, which is also where the 50 and the 100 day moving averages converge, then the prospect of a short squeeze in euro dollar remains very much on the table. Okay, was there anything else you wanted to add, mate, before we no, move on to cable? No, that's great. I think we should go into cable now. And then right. maybe after that we may want to look at uh, euro pound as well. Yeah, we'll have a quick look at euro sterling. Also, pound against the dollar, fairly similar. What is important to understand also is that in terms of rate hike expectations, the Federal Reserve and the Bank of England are likely to be on fairly similar glide paths, particularly after the average earnings data that we saw out of the UK this morning where we saw three months average earnings coming at 2.7 percent well above expectations. Now, you know, a large part of that could well be as a result of pay rises coming in online in April. Um, certainly the April month is, is the new tax year. That's usually when um, firms allocate pay rises and bonuses as well. So you could actually see an artificial bounce as a result of that. But I certainly think if you can, if average earnings increases can average about 2.3, 2.4% over the course of the next three or four months, then the case for a rate hike starts to increase. Um, and it will certainly put pressure on the Bank of England. You may recall last year that Martin Wheel and Ian McCafferty were the two dissenters who were arguing for a rate hike through most of 2014. They only pulled their necks in um, at the beginning of this year because of the inflation, the weak inflation data. Inflation is still likely, I think, to remain fairly benign. We've recovered from a deflationary phase in April, but we've only come in around about 0.1%. But overall, I think markets will start to bring in their rate expectations, particularly if wages data and inflation data starts to show any signs of starting to gain a little bit of traction. Now, the key level for me on cable here is, is the previous highs at 158, but I'm particularly interested in this little piece of price action here that we've got here. Look at these progressively higher highs and higher lows. All the dips are very well bought into. If you look at the long shadows on these, on these candles here, it suggests that you know, the markets are very, very reluctant about being short of cable, and certainly we can come all the way back to these series of lows back here, around about 154.80, 154.50. But overall, the uptrend, I think, is fairly well established, and I think it's going to take something quite substantive to really undermine it. Certainly, if we look at um, this line here that I've just drawn in, um, it's, I think it's probably a fairly short-term one, but we can certainly come all the way back here without undermining the overall uptrend, but certainly in the context of the overall trend on cable, and if we go out slightly longer term as well to the monthly chart, we had a very similar um, bullish candle on the monthly chart, not to the same extent as euro dollar, but what we've also got here is if we look at the daily chart, we've also broken above the 200 day moving average, the 50 and the 100 have already crossed. So they've started to turn very, very positive, and now the 200-day moving average is also likely to act as a significant support level over the course of the next few trading sessions. Was there anything you wanted to pipe in, mate? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention, so right now, Carney's been talking uh, last uh, at the inflation report about uh, starting rate hikes in the middle of 2016. I, I guess there's a couple of things in there. First of all, I, I think we're still both under the, uh, going under the assumption that the, the, uh, the Bank of England would be likely to raise after the Fed starts to raise. But my, my next question is, so if, you're, if we get to, 
rising inflation in the UK, and the Fed looks like they go later this year, so that leaves a window for them to perhaps move it up into, say, I don't know, March of March of next year. I guess the question is, does, does the, the, the possible Brexit referendum play a, uh, a role with monetary policy, or does it not matter as much as, say, the, like, the election did a, uh, back, back in the first half of this year? I think there's an argument to be said for the Brexit referendum, but I don't see what the Bank of England can conceivably do with respect to monetary policy to offset that. I think in terms of if the government embarks on a significant fiscal tightening program, that could well prompt the Bank of England to stay easier for longer if there's any evidence that the tightening is causing a little bit of a slowdown in, UK, in the UK's growth. I think there is certainly a, um, an argument for that, um, but I so, yeah, second... I mean, it really, it really depends on when they have the referendum. Yeah, and that that that's still not. Uh, I, that's that's still not been decided, decided yet. So once we, that gets yeah. decided, maybe then we'll have a better. Uh, better idea but certainly if it takes out that high, that the may high there it would i would find that to, that quite intriguing and would suggest to me that people might be starting to think of an earlier an earlier rate hike i still think 2015 is probably out for the uh, for the bank of england but you know there's certainly uh, there's certainly a lot of room in the in the first half of next year for them to do something i guess if uh, if inflation pressures start to build like they've been saying there's also a big chart point around about 158.80 50% of the entire down move from the July highs to the um, April lows. So I think yeah, there's going to be natural resistance. Either. You could get, a, as you say, we had a stop at 158.20 there. We could slightly overshoot that, rip out a few stops, stall and come back. But overall, I think 158.80 is going to be a bit of a barrier anyway. Yeah. You know, you wanted to talk about euro sterling, didn't you? So let's bring oh, yeah, that up. Yeah, just briefly, just to, to see which way these are kind of going. Because to me, it's been range-bound lately if we... Uh, if we if we draw this out a little longer, Michael, and uh, and a little, what, we, what we are getting a downturn here, and we are starting to see it come back on uh, uh, going down is is in Sterling's favor. So we are starting to see that uh, that going down again. I'm trying to figure out myself if this is a, w this is kind of a pretty big uh, W pattern here. But uh, I think if we mm. start to get down towards the lows of this again. That uh, that we could see that uh, that in trouble, particularly if uh, if we start to get to the, uh, a, a sense that that the UK could start to raise interest rates while the uh, ECB is going flat out on QE. But uh, yeah, I, mean, I wonder if we're getting about, any kind of haven flows there. This but, is all, all, all about policy divergence as well. Yeah, this 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 trade is a policy divergence trade. Um, the ECB aren't going to be cutting rates anytime soon. If anything, no. they're probably going to remain easier for longer. The likelihood of a messy default from Greece is certainly going to keep them very much, I think, right in amongst it. And that's going to push certainly the euro down against the pound simply because the, the you know because of the the the, the, uh, the rate divergence story. Probably less so against the dollar because I think the Fed has much more to lose by raising rates prematurely than say the Bank of England for example because of all that all those dollar loans all those do all that dollar liquidity that's out there that's that's leaking out of emerging markets so um ultimately I don't think either central bank will raise rates this year um and I'm still targeting Q1 of next year for for both of them so I think we're probably going to remain in a bit of a range, I think, in euro sterling. With the base of the range, I think we've already seen that, and the top of the range around about 74. Right. You wanted to talk about dollar CAD, didn't you, young man? Uh, yes, let's do dollar CAD as well. So with the uh, with the U.S. dollar uh, likely to be active today on the Fed decision, we'll uh, we'll also take a peek at uh, at dollar CAD here, which is, is a function of two things. One is the U.S. dollar, and one is the... Um, oil price and and so we've seen the oil price has uh, has leveled off kind of around uh, sixty dollars for WTI and in around sixty five for Brent. And, Let me just uh, and bring so, that up for you. Oh great. Go on, go ahead. Carry okay, on. so we're seeing here that uh, that we're in a uh, 
going into a sideways pattern for uh, WTI. We've had a good rally here up off the bottom, but uh, but now we're at the point where the, the question is, can, can WTI continue to go higher, and if so, how far? Because we've still got the... Um, the Saudis and, and, and the Iraqis and, and other countries in OPEC have uh, have taken advantage of the uh, the price decline to actually ramp up their own production and uh, and steal market share back from the Americans. And so the question becomes: At which point do the Americans get fed up with this and uh, and start pumping again? And uh, and so the upside for crude could be uh, could be limited here uh, in the near term. Uh, maybe maybe you get 65, maybe 70, but I think you're going to have a pretty time. rough go seeing 80. In fact, that 200-day moving average there, the blue line looks like a, a pretty good potential resistance there. That would be uh, could be quite uh, could be difficult to break. If it does, then uh, then perhaps we are starting to head on a uh, a more positive course. But we've had a uh, right now we are still uh, still going sideways in a range between about 55.50 and 61.50. So if we start to do actually do break that 200-day average there, which looks to me a little closer to 62, um, that would be fairly significant and signal a pretty big another upturn that maybe carries us up into the high mid to high 60s. On uh, on WTI, if we get a breakout, I certainly, on I certainly w think. I certainly, certainly think ahead. if you get a breakout on WTI, Colin, and that looks like a rectangle to me. Yes. Um, then you, the measured move objective for that would probably be um, sixty-seven, sixty-eight dollars a barrel. So yes. it would probably, you know, on a break of the two hundred day moving average, you could certainly get a significant move there. Uh, yes, absolutely. So that's so, a. Uh, so dollar cat. Yeah. So dollar cat. If we get a breakout for WTI, we could see dollar cat roll down again. It has uh, it's topped out at a lower high already near uh, 125, and then resistance has come down again towards 124. So. Uh, and 126, we had a double top here. So just like when we've seen, uh, we've seen the uh, the oil price had uh, had come down, and uh, and the uh, the Canadian dollar had come down. It's been on a rebound as uh, as well. And uh, and CAD has also been outperforming the Norwegian krona lately. They're both oil sensitive currencies, but. Um, but basically, the uh, the CAD's more sensitive to the U.S. Norway's more sensitive to Europe. With the European risk out there, Norway's been dragging have been dragging a little bit. They're uh, they are having a meeting tomorrow at uh, at Norges Bank where they are expected to cut interest rates as well. So we'll see what comes of that. That we could also see some activity in the oil currencies around that as well. Yeah, I certainly saw a report today um, out of North Dakota. Um, Apparently, um, U.S. out there's suggesting that the North Dakota has suggested that U.S. output has peaked in that region, um, which would probably help underpin WTI prices. And Angola has announced it's cutting crude exports in August to an eight-month low. So those two factors alone could actually, you know, potentially put a floor under crude prices, but. You know, we have been in a bit of a range on crude for quite some time, so um, certainly worth keeping an eye on the supply factors because I don't think the demand factor is going to change that much. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Yeah, and, and and of course, and on that, the uh, and it continues to be the how far can we get? Well, we could still get one more up leg out of this. Uh, could we see yeah, 80 or 100? So. I think it'd be more difficult because of the uh, because of the uh, the supply war. But I think most people would be happy if you got something up into the into the high 60s. It's certainly a lot better than the low 40s. Okay, so let's look at the S and P because I think obviously I think in the wake of tonight's decision, the S and P could be quite interesting. Certainly, finding a significant area of support around about the 2075, 2070 level. Um, certainly, I think if you look at some of the the candles on this particular chart, you can see that um, the long shadows here d does suggest that you know people really do want to buy the S and P. Um, you know, every time we've tried to go lower. We haven't closed anywhere near the lows, and yet when markets wanted to buy it, the shadows on, on on the highs, then they're not that great, which suggests to me that, you know, essentially that, you know, people are more comfortable buying the S&P than they are selling it, because the long shadows on 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 the, on the down candles suggest that, you know, people want to basically square up before they go home, which doesn't appear to be the case. When you look at the um, shadows on the upside, 
people generally tend to be fairly happy in that regard, given the fact that there are very few shadows on any of the upper candles on the top side. So certainly have a look around about 2075 on the downside, but also on the upside around about 2110, 2115. Um, I think it's unlikely that any decision tonight will see us break out of the range that we've been in pretty much since the beginning of the year. Though we have a slightly upward bias, seeing as we started round about 2050 on the year. So we're only round about 50 points up from where we started the year. Yeah, and really, we're, for all the U.S. indices, we're in a big sideways trend here. And, and this is not uncommon. It's, it's what I call the mid-cycle consolidation. And we saw it in 94, 95, and we saw it in 04, 05, and now we're seeing it again. And, and what it is is that you get a, a massive run-up off the bottom with the, uh, the liquidity that comes from the central banks. Then when that starts to get stripped away, it puts a bit of a cap on stocks. They, they struggle to make much headway. But at the same time, you have a, an underlying strengthening of the economy, which which is why they're raising interest, talking about raising interest rates is because the economy is getting back up on its feet. So that puts a floor under stocks. And you end up with markets going in a sideways channel that some of them can be fairly big. Like you, you, can, you can talk like a thousand point on the Dow kind of channel or say 100 points on the S&P, like big wide channels that, that sit in place for the better part of say nine months to a year. Um, if we start counting this one say back in December in a year or, uh, or February on a nine month basis, this kind of sideways trading range, which is, is great for trading, and uh, but confuses uh, confuses investors uh, and people with a longer-term perspective. You can see this go on for probably through the summer and likely into the kind of October November time frame. Which, which interestingly enough, if we uh, if we uh, don't get uh, much color on interest rates here, is when the Fed could be actually starting to raise rates, uh, depending on uh, on how things go today. Okay, so that's the U.S. markets. Let's have a look at European markets because they've behaved completely differently in the six months of the year to date. And we can see that borne out in my, my DAX chart, which I'm going to basically open up twice because this is the most recent price action, I think, from, from a daily chart here. And actually what I'm going to do, so this is my original move from the 2000 and 11 lows to the 2015 highs. Now we're going to take it down to a daily chart. Now we've just broken out of an uptrend from the October lows. We've been trading sideways since the peaks in April and we're now trading down to, towards the 200 day moving average. And I think it's quite notable, notable that I think that what we've seen here on the DAX is pretty much the same sort of pattern that we've seen on the Euro stocks 50 as well. And for me, I think what you've got to look at when you're looking at European markets is the overall trend. And we're certainly seeing a significant, re certainly seeing a significant correction. But thus far, from the levels that we saw in 2011, we're still well, well above the levels that we were even in 2014 and the, peak, and the peaks in 2014. We are still well above the peaks that we saw in 2014. So what everyone's talk, been talking about, how poorly European markets have been behaving over the course of the last few weeks. Let's not forget how far they've come since the beginning of this year. The DAX was below 10,000 at the beginning of this year. We saw a bearish key day reversal on the weekly chart in the uh, middle of March, April rather, in the middle of April there. And in April we also saw a fairly negative candle as well. So we've declined for three months in a row. So overall I'm sticking with the trend. This is the trend on the four hour chart. We can see it quite nicely. Um, you can look at the series of peaks around 11,400, but overall, we are probably going to continue to trade lower over the course of the next few weeks and months, maybe into September, before we even think about potentially going back higher again. And that ties in a little bit with my firmer euro belief. If the euro goes up, it's going to reduce the attractiveness of European stocks as an investment. So. That's also something that you have to bear in mind as well. We do the Euro 50, you can see it's a similar sort of 
chart, again, daily chart here. Again, the 200-day moving average, which suggests that maybe we could see a little bit of a rebound back to the top of this channel if we get down there. We've certainly, we've certainly been a lot more difficult to respect this particular channel in the same way that the DAX has, but overall, it still ties in with the narrative. We're approaching a long-term moving average. We're likely to find a degree of support there simply because of the, the channel support that we've got there. Um, but while we're above, sorry, while we're below 3,500 on the Euro stocks 50, then we're probably going to see further downward pressure brought to bear in the overall downtrend that we've been in since the highs in May. Also, if we look at the Bund, it's a similar story, and this ties in with the yield story. And this is a bit of a this is a bit of a tasty looking chart, certainly in the context of the moves that we've seen thus far. So. If you're looking at the Bund, I'm looking at this 153 area to suggest that this particular downtrend that we've been in since April is still intact. And I think if you look at the peaks here and you look at the peaks in the DAX and you look at the peaks in the Eurostox 50, if you want to see a turnaround in European markets, then you want to see a turnaround here first. You want to see Bund prices go up and yields go back down. If that doesn't happen, then you could potentially see um, further downside, tracking bond prices lower. And that's essentially why I not only look at euro, and I not only look at the, the US dollar, and look at the spread differentials, I also look at the correlations that have been working thus far. They don't work all the time. They will break eventually, the correlations between the bond market and the equity market. And we can, we can pretty much date the decline in equity markets to the day the bond prices start to roll. The bond price started to roll over. Okay. Um, does anyone have any questions for me and Colin before we wrap this up? Please use the chat facility. I will just type a question. I'll just type something out there, and you can reply to that message that I've just sent to all of you. So is there anything thus far that any of you ladies and gents would like to ask either myself or Colin before we basically call time on this and put it up on YouTube for you to listen back if you so wish. Have you got anything you want to add, Colin? Uh, no, I think we've covered everything for uh, for today. This has been a, uh, a really good call, I think. And okay. I really appreciate everyone joining us today. Okay, well, thanks, guys. As I say, Colin and I usually do this once. We do do this once a month. Um, you can find out um, basically where all the events. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You can usually find out where we where all our events are um, scheduled. Dot UK helps if I can actually type. But we do, Colin and I do two webinars a month. We do one for non-farm payrolls, um, which is the first Friday. And we also do one every month like this, where we talk about some of the key events that are scheduled to be coming up over the course of the next, next few months. So non-farm payrolls is on the 2nd of July, not the 3rd, because the 3rd is a US holiday. And the next webinar that Colin and I do of this type is on the 23rd of July. Okay, so 2nd of July, 23rd of July, um, all the events calendars are there. If you want to basically keep up to speed with the research that Colin and myself do, you can find it in the news and education section of the cmcmarkets.co.uk website or the cmcmarkets.ca website. Otherwise, Colin and I would both like to thank you for your um, thank you for your attention today, and uh, we look forward to speaking to you again very soon.